Dear Diary, it's been five months since Dinesh D'Souza used the Infinity Gauntlet to rewrite history to fit his Republican agenda. Since he forced facts to care about his feelings, my channel is gone. I'm destitute. In desperation, I had to eat my jacket for sustenance. But I think I have come up with a plan which could restore the timeline. I've been preparing for months to defeat D'Souza, and now my plan reaches its endgame. Oh, hey, hey, he did the thing where you say the name of the thing in the thing. I love when they do that. I am going to make a video essay, one last chance, and send it back to Dinesh as a child. If I can sway him then, it might cause a cascade which ripples throughout the timeline. Time travel is complicated and kept a strict secret by alternate history YouTubers. However, after explaining the situation to an alternate history YouTuber companion, I was able to secure one video sent to make this one point of divergence. This is that video. Hello, Dinesh. I know this video is going to come as a bit of a shock to you, uh, but I am from the future. I am trying to fix the present by trying to redeem you, I guess your past self, which is you right now. Time travel's weird, okay? You're about to become a commentator on the battlefield that is history. And you're about to do some science fiction shenanigans that could disrupt everything. So I want to talk about the significance of the abuse your adult self is doing to history. But first I'm gonna have to have a discussion about narrative, the meaning of history, the understanding of the past, and sort of your role within our collective narrative building in the political battlefield that is the way that we understand the past. Narrative has been shown again and again to be extremely formative in how we build memories and develop a autobiography that makes us who we are. It's as old as the most ancient humans sitting around a campfire swapping scary stories. And really is the way that we understand things. Almost every industry and academic discipline talks about how to use narrative in order to express ideas within the discipline. Even areas you wouldn't expect like engineering or the hard sciences. There's some evidence that psychological trauma, especially the kind of trauma that creates PTSD symptoms, might be a result of a disruption of our personal narrative. And so often, trying to integrate a traumatic event into one's own story is one of the things that therapists use to treat people who have PTSD. Because having this event that does not follow along our story sticking out of us like a knife out of our belly is actually like pretty hard for us to tolerate. And narrative is not just important for your individual story. You exist in a context, a culture, an identity, multiple identities intersecting with each other. And all of those come with different narratives of who you are and how you came to be. You can think of this as a greater collective memory. And this is actually the kind of thing that I studied a bunch when I was doing my PhD. The way that narrative shapes our past and our identity on a grander scale can tell us large stories about our history. And our history sort of is the grand narrative telling us today who we are, where we came from, and in some ways, where we aspire to go. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. If history is the grand narrative that we collectively tell ourselves to tell us who we are, then that makes history pretty significant. And there are pretty big stakes involved. So lots of people are trying to contribute into it, and not just professional historians. It's a big collective work that's being added to all the time. So in that case, what is history, like the academic discipline known as history? And I'll tell you, trying to define history is actually more difficult than it sounds. So first of all, the past. The past is a series of events, things that happened before now. I imagine that's not too complicated of a thing to explain, but the past is also wholly inaccessible. It is not here now. It never will be again. The laws of entropy sort of prevent us from restoring things back to how they were. And so there's no way for us to actually tangibly experience things that happened in the past. So historians do two things primarily. One, they study the remains of the past called primary sources, try to decipher and figure out different pieces of evidence by what scraps are left behind. And the second thing that historians do is they take all of that evidence 
apply analysis and try to uh, sew it all together and figure out something about the past, have some sort of insight. And this, more often than not, is expressed through writing. And that writing, historians call secondary sources. And so historians write these works of secondary sources, but because the writers of history are also human, they too organize their thoughts through narrative. And so, if you read any history book, it typically has narrative aspects to it. And we're encouraged to do so, because having narrative aspects to your writing in many different formats is considered an aspect of good writing, because it's persuasive and our brains attune to it well. And this is where we need to talk about someone who contributed to the philosophy of history by the name of Hayden White. This isn't the stuff you learn in, like, history class, it's the stuff you learn in, like, history methods class, <laughs> which, given the research I did, was kind of, like, one of my uh, more favorite subjects. Anyways, Hayden White, knowing that the past really no longer existed, and that writing was done through humans of a period, sort of applying their narrative understanding to analyze the past, he's stated in his work that a historian's writing can be studied in similar ways that somebody would study literature. This means that secondary analysis, academic history work, has genre, it has conventions, it has tropes. If we didn't do this, historical analysis would be big lists of unconnected events with no thought about how anything plugs into any other thing and has no larger insights about how the world worked. And there's a strange minority of people in my audience who actually seem to think that they would prefer it that way. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, why don't you just say the things that happen and do no insight, no analysis. Fairly often what they do want is analysis and connection. It's just that they're mad that my analysis doesn't jive with their preconceived notions of how the world works. This also means that to be a historian means to be able to study relics from the past, but also we have to be writers. This means one actual useful excuse if you want to do a history degree is that it makes you a pretty strong writer and that history classes tend to emphasize uh, developing good writing skills. For the record, this does not mean making things up. In no way is this getting into fiction territory or fabrication. But it does mean that a good historian has to be able to keep an eye open for connections, relationships, lines of causation, things like that. And hopefully, if you can do that, much like how an author can get to the larger themes through a work, a historian might be able to gain some sort of insight about how the world of the past worked that no other historian has been able to glean insight on before. And oftentimes, with the benefit of hindsight, a historian can see the larger picture and see structures that people at the time wouldn't even be able to understand. This is why I actually had a conversation about this once with my supervisor. We came to the conclusion that history and historians would still need to exist even if we invented time machines because historians look back on things with hindsight and can see the larger picture, or at least that's what we endeavor to do. And I guess that's good because this video is gonna be sent to the past, which means time travel is real, so it's staying a job. But if you wanna look at secondary literature of history, that does mean that you can also look at historical writing and know that every individual author is going to have an individual take and analysis of the past. Because everybody has a point of view, and it's sort of impossible to not evaluate, analyze, and make conclusions about the bodies of evidence that you're working through. Even if you're trying to avoid it, it comes out in the process of simply committing ideas and things to the written word. And this is basically why history is never going to be a completed project. Never. It's impossible. No way. And you might be led to think that this means anything goes. There's no rules. You can write anything you want. But history is still an academic discipline. And historians still do a lot of work to keep each other honest. This is what the whole peer review system is for. And at the same time, you're usually never alone in the area you're studying. So there will be other colleagues who are reading the same sources and coming to altogether different conclusions. Trust me. Uh, when you get into a narrow enough slice of that field, you're going to know all the other ones, and you're probably going to have significant disagreements that come out over pints when you're at academic conferences. And we do it this way because history, no matter how hard we've tried in the past, is basically impossible to be objective. You're not going to be able to know any real facts about the past in the same way that we know the gravitational constant, for example. Which is also funny because I get a lot of comments on my Step Back videos that I need to be more objective, which going back to the other thing, is basically them also saying that they're mad that 
my personal point of view doesn't match up with their preconceived notions about how the world works. Because objectivity is something that is not really up to interpretation. We know for a fact that gravity works the way it does. Why? Because we've done tons and tons and tons of experiments to verify it. And that's the key part experiments. History can't really be objective, it can't really be a science because it's impossible to do experiments. Outside of like alternate history fiction, there is no way to go back in time and change something to see if you change the variables a little bit, if it changes the way that society functions. Trust me, if you could, it would be a very different field. So instead of being able to do experiments, the way that historians work is that they try to do what they can with what evidence survives from the past era they're studying. But in the end, historians try to find a corpus or a body of data from the period they're trying to analyze and try to extrapolate as much information from it as possible. And of course, the field develops with new cultural developments. For example, the early historical field was written in a time when nationalism was a big deal. It was also at a time when the perspectives of white privileged men were on top and pretty much everybody else was secondary. This meant that the earliest history works were these long drawn out narratives of countries and that we had a extreme bias not only for Western sources but for the written word. One of the major problems historians have had to overcome is the fact that history still has a pro-literacy bias. And very often, because they are the ones who made the sources that survived to today, we put a lot more emphasis on societies that had writing. And we don't get to see what non-literate civilizations had to say. We have to learn more through archaeology, we have to learn more through oral history. This is why people who disparage oral history, even if they're not intending to, privileging and biasing what it is we see and how we see things. We've also developed more and more sophisticated analytical frameworks for understanding the past, especially as developments in the social sciences and the humanities have come up along. So things like analyzing the past through race and gender and class have become more and more common. Not to mention, and I'm sure this will get me in a little bit of trouble, but uh, we have been more interested in interrogating the filters and blinders that we ourselves see the world through. That process of interrogation is of course known as postmodernism. And through these developments, historians have been able to open up more sources and to learn more about what the past was like. For example, one of the most important works of American historical writing in the last 50 years was based on an analysis of a source which was um, a midwife's daily journal. And people didn't take that too seriously, they didn't think there was that much use out of something like that uh, before, but the book that came out of it, uh, A Midwife's Tale, it turned out to become an extremely insightful work in the way that we understand the lives of women in early America. Oral history has been able to open up so many more stories of communities and peoples that we did not get to see before. One example is that oral histories of indigenous peoples have given us insights into the past of indigenous societies that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise because there was no written language. Or for a more recent example, there was a really great work that was a oral history where they interviewed a bunch of people who lived in Buffalo, New York's lesbian community, and we were able to tell a history about a people who don't typically get grandiose works written about them. And right now, What's trendy in history is trying to learn insights about the past, uh, about subjects that don't typically get lots and lots of writing done about them. Food history, understanding the past culture through what we ate and how we ate it is becoming a really big thing, as well as trying to study subjects like animals and what our relationship with animals were like in the past, or the lives of children who by their nature, don't get to have a lot of books written about their past. And we learned some pretty cool things, like how there are children's rhyming songs in like kind of child culture today that have roots going all the way back to the Roman Empire. Or there was what I was trying to do with my PhD work before I dropped out to you know, do step back, I was trying to look at big data analytics tools, like things that have been used in more uh, data journalism and data-driven analysis, because that's becoming more of a thing these days with artificial intelligence and such, and use that to study 
huge bodies of data that no human being could read in their lifetime. Because this is one of the fundamental problems coming up in studying the history of times where the internet is a thing. And now while history began as a more objective cousin of philosophy, we learned over the years that history really can't be objective. And we've learned more and more from accepting the role of history as sort of being this weird hybrid between the social sciences and the humanities. For example, my undergraduate university had history in the humanities department, while my graduate school university had history in the social sciences department. It also means history is always going to be open for change, reinterpretation, and analysis. Even things that we think are settled and well-established could be overturned with one new discovery or just looking at things from a new angle. As I mentioned earlier, history doesn't just happen in academia. If anything, there's a problem because the work that happens in academia has a bit of a wall between them and the popular understanding of the past that's happening in the general public. That's sort of one of the reasons I left academia to do step back. And if history's gonna play a role in this large scale um, narrative about how we understand ourselves, then history is pretty goddamn important. And it also means that there's gonna be a lot of interests at play trying to change that story. And so basically, inevitably, history becomes a battlefield. So our grand cultural narrative is always going to be open for reinterpretation and reanalysis, and that's always going to be a minefield of different political interests. And in many ways, the claim to be neutral or ambiguous in that is essentially to say that the way our understanding of the past is now is basically fine the way it is. So it's basically like being a centrist. Just to give you some examples of the battlefield of history, the first one that comes to mind is Texas. The Texas School Board is one of the largest purchasers of textbooks, and therefore the textbook that they purchase is the one that many other states are going to go with as well for their history curriculum. So whatever's included in the Texas history textbook is going to set the standard for a lot of American states. And there was controversy several years ago over a new Texas history textbook that tried to reinterpret the past in a lot of ways that was designed to sort of legitimize a more right-wing view of the world. For example, downplaying the role of slavery. In the textbook, one of the things that was a little glaring was that African slaves were referred to as migrant workers as a way to use euphemism to downplay the horrors and brutality that came with the transatlantic slave trade. In the same book, there was an attempt to rewrite and sort of redeem the history of Joseph McCarthy, who was a paranoid conservative who went on this witch hunt to try and find secret communists operating within the government. And in the end, it was either overplayed or non-existent, and at the same time was used to oppress and discriminate and uh, treat a lot of LGBTQ plus people terribly. These projects aren't based on new evidence or, you know, up-to-date historical writing from the field. It is an attempt to rewrite the past, reinterpret things in order to fit a right-wing worldview. And oftentimes, when done for reasons other than academics, like this textbook, sources can be omitted, twisted, or at worst, fabricated in order to make the past, the narrative written about the past, fit a specific agenda. And that's when things start getting into pseudo-history and really dishonest takes. You ever wonder why Nazis are so adamant about denying the Holocaust happened? Speaking of Nazis, in the context of narrative being so important for how we understand ourselves, history often becomes a very important tool in the realm of propaganda. So what is propaganda? Oh boy. Propaganda is its core actually rather neutral. It is using media to try and change opinions. It's persuasive media. And any sufficiently advanced state will need to use propaganda in order to more or less force the people of the country to go along with what the state wants them to do. In a country where there's a thin veneer of democracy, where they get to elect one person to represent their interests every four years, then the propaganda has to be 
even more intense because they need to, you know, make sure that the options are kept limited in those votes and that the civilians don't get too uppity. And propaganda doesn't necessarily have to be for bad purposes. It has sort of a negative connotation today, but it doesn't always have to be. Under this definition, I could be considered a propagandist because my videos do try to convince people of something. I try very hard to be up to date and to be academically and intellectually honest. I'm not perfect, I'm only human and I'm only one person. But myself and this YouTube channel most definitely have a point of view and I most definitely want more people to hear said point of view. But propaganda is probably more often known for more nefarious purposes. One thing you might hear is something called nation building. If you're a state, an organization that dominates over a group of arbitrary lines drawn in the earth and all the people under it are subservient to you, you have to find some way for the people who are being subjugated to align their interests with your own. Otherwise, you just get chaos and destruction. So you need to make all of these people feel like they're part of the same team. And to do so, they make something called an imagined community which is sort of an idea that I need to make its own video, but uh, it's basically the idea of creating an identity that takes a bunch of people with, you know, otherwise would have no strong connection with each other and build an identity around them. You see this a lot in like post-colonial states where the borders of the country were drawn by a bunch of white people who had no idea about the, you know, situation on the ground. And then the country, as it becomes uh, decolonized, has to really dig into the past and try to find whatever they can to draw a narrative that takes all of these people and say, you have a shared past, you have a shared identity, you are this. Because, you know, there's just this constant need for states to justify their own existence and explain why they are the representatives of you and why your interests should align with whatever they want them to be. I think the one that people are most familiar with is Nazi Germany, where there was definitely a propaganda effort to dig into the past uh, to create this Aryan identity, which was based on like bad archaeology, and also try to dig into like Teutonic history and pagan stuff and attempt to build this identity of like the ubermensch German, which never really existed, and say this, this is the ideal person that our state is trying to work for. And it's just vague enough that enough people can say, hey, that, that's me. I should do what the state says to do. Oh, that's, that's commit genocide of 24 million people. Okay. Okay, I guess, I guess we're just doing a genocide now. See what I meant about this having real stakes? This battlefield over how we're gonna understand ourselves and what history we're going to tell us about how we got to where we are, it continues to today. And one of the number one warriors in that battlefield is, well, you, Dinesh D'Souza. You, Dinesh D'Souza, have made your entire grift trying to reinterpret American history to fit a neoliberal, neoconservative, Christian supremacist agenda. If you want an example of this kind of work, I would recommend you look at Dinesh D'Souza Infinity War, which I guess I'll send along with this video to you. But the movie Hillary's America is not the only example. One other documentary by Dinesh D'Souza was America Imagine the World Without Her, which was this doomsday scenario about what the world would be like if America wasn't constantly expanding an imperial uh, army that invaded countries at will across the world to, you know, impose the will of an ever-shrinking group of hyper-rich plutocrats. <sighs> and you tweeted this weird thing to try and associate the fight for, you know, the existential life of humanity and equivocated with the Nazis because you didn't like Greta Thunberg, who was also a child. This was, this, this was a real dark side of you, Dinesh. But honestly, getting into all of the things that are dishonest and bad history and propaganda that Dinesh Souza has done would take many videos, and I'd probably be a lot more popular of a YouTuber if I focused more on stuff like that. But Tristan, you said that having a point of view is fine. That's what history is all about. But the problem is, is that the analysis that Dinesh D'Souza does is extremely dishonest. A lot of his work 
takes contradictory evidence and just chucks that the f out, and then fills in a lot of blank areas with conspiratorial speculation. And whatever's left is twisted beyond belief to craft a story about what America is that is full of holes and is distorted beyond any recognition for any American historian. But the thing is, what's true is less important than what feels right and what fits somebody's preconceived notions about how the world works. So, as a result, Dinesh D'Souza is extremely popular because this idea of American history comforts a conservative worldview. As well, Dinesh wants to build a nationalistic American history that, if taught to young people, can give them a narrative that instills them with compliance to an ever-increasingly authoritarian state and an endlessly growing global empire. And Dinesh D'Souza is not alone in this. This video is actually inspired by Donald Trump uh, announcing that he wanted to start something called the 1776 Commission. It's a proposal to make a new American history curriculum that focuses on outdated, discredited, white supremacist ideas of what America is. And specifically, maybe this is what made me real, real mad, he attacked Howard Zinn, my boy. I've sometimes been called the Howard Zinn of history YouTube, so I, got, I gotta go to bat. Howard Zinn is by no means perfect, but People's History of the United States is probably one of the better books out there for uh, breaking the nationalistic indoctrination of American history education and has probably brought a lot more people out of the ignorance that comes with the way that we teach American history. And while we're at it, I know that journalists don't do follow-up questions in America for some reason, but it would have been real great if during the announcement of this program just anybody could have asked Donald Trump who he actually thinks Howard Zinn is, because I'd be very curious to know what Donald Trump knows about Howard Zinn. <laughs> he attacked the American history education as making people feel bad for their whiteness. Some real blood and soil coming out of this. And the idea behind the 1776 Commission is that the American Revolution set forth a great project that helped democratize and liberalize and create a chain of events that would lead to the increasing of civil rights and human rights for everybody, which is 100% incorrect and uh, is trying to just completely ignore all of American history in order to fit a preconceived notion that America is good and America is great and you should love everything about it. Wah. This is an attempt to create nationalists, to create not so much a history but a mythology, and one that can justify an authoritarian state that is brutal at home and justifies imperialism abroad. And don't forget, it also advances white supremacy. You know, the exact same type of program that the Nazis did. Jeez, Tristan, why do you call everybody that you disagree with a Nazi just because they do the exact same type of nationalistic program that the Nazis did? I am tired. I am very, very tired of this. Now this whole 1776 commission is a backlash against something called the 1619 Project, which is a New York Times-led program, which, you know, has some legitimate criticisms around it, but at its core is a pretty good idea, which is to focus on American history and think about it as beginning in 1619, which is the date where the first African slave landed in what would become the United States. And it's a way to look at American history where anti-black racism is the center focal point of what America was built around. And sure, yeah, the 1619 Project does have some legitimate criticisms around it. But reacting to it by building this nationalistic history program that would make doubles blush is extremely chilling. All right, uh, I guess I'm going to break down the fourth wall for a second and say, I made this video right before the election because while there's many, many, many things to get your blood pumping and get you terrified about the future of the United States, uh, this one, as the historian, made me uh, worried. And I wanted to bring it to your attention because I am like a cat that brings you gifts that are disgusting things that make you hate the world even more. But more or less, in the madness of everything going on in the world right now, I just wanted to make sure that the 
extremely scary part of this with the 1776 commission didn't just fly under the radar. Because this kind of stuff is part and parcel with dictators, autocrats, and fascists. Trust me, no good history education should be designed to make you patriotic. If anything, the better you understand the past, the less proud of your country you should be. And besides, nothing should make anybody patriotic because patriotism is also kind of bad, but that's also another video. Now you might think that I'm just saying all of this to make white people feel bad. And my answer to you is maybe a little. Actually, wait, no. It's not that, and to frame it like that is extremely dishonest. Our past is a painful one of hardship and oppression and violence and cruelty. And whether or not we acknowledge it, we live with that legacy. It shapes the world we live in today. And there's something extremely privileged about just ignoring the dark corners of our past. Because history built this extremely unjust and unequal world we live in today. And instead of denial, we could instead maybe try truth and reconciliation, where we acknowledge the dark parts of our past and try to make amends, try to bring people back together. Because simply denying the past will just mean that the ghosts of history will continue to haunt us. So Dinesh, I hope you see this uh, and learn that the way that you're approaching history is abusive and hurting us and making the world a worse place. And if you're as dedicated to freedom as you seem to like to say about yourself in all these movies, then um, maybe you should think about that. I really, really hope this works. All right, I think this might work. I'm going to take out the SD card and send it to Matt and uh, just need a little bit of money for postage and... I'd like to thank a new sponsor on this channel, one I've been excited to work with for a bit, and that is CuriosityStream. As you probably can imagine, I grew up, and still to this day, watch way, way too many documentaries. CuriosityStream has exactly that. On it, there's thousands of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows on topics like history, nature, science, food, technology, travel, and more! This includes many award-winning exclusives and originals and collections hand-picked by experts. And as a regular Chromecast user, I am really happy to see it's available on any device. So, if you need to find out how the Tudor home was a death trap at 4 a.m. on Christmas morning, you can. Smart TV for that smart TV. If you use the code Step Back History, you'll get CuriosityStream for a whole year for $14.99. Kind of an eye-popping deal, actually. Just go to the link in the description or the pinned comment and go wild. Thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Excellent. Let's send this puppy out. I made this video because I'm terrified. Authoritarianism's on the rise. And history is always one of its victims. And I guess also by making this video, I'm laying out sort of the mission statement of Step Back, which is something I haven't done in a long time. This channel's changed a lot since 2015. I have changed a lot since 2015. And uh, I wanted to reflect that, and sort of say everything explicitly. And also at its core, I wanted to talk about why I care so much about history. History is, at the end of the day, how we understand ourselves and our place in the world, as both individuals and as people. It's also the way that we understand the structure of the world we live in today. And so how we tell history, who we frame, how we center it, what we include and what we leave out, says a lot about who we are and who we intend to become. And being a society that ignores the pain that we've caused others is not one I want to be. It shows that we don't value their struggle. We don't value their humanity. And I know that I did like a goofy, fun science fiction framing here with the Marvel movie thing, but uh, Dinesh D'Souza and Donald Trump and people like them want to rewrite history because they want to create a past where white people are at the center and the horrors that were committed on behalf of the United States and states in general are dismissed, diminished, or omitted. Because at the end of the day, to people like these propagandists and the right in general, their humanity doesn't matter. And we can fight against it. Don't let it stand. Read history. Teach history.
And always keep your eyes open for whose stories aren't being told. Oh yeah, and fuck the 1776 Commission. If you want to learn about a case of the right trying to rewrite history in order to fit their agenda, there is Dinesh Souza Infinity War. Go watch that and I'll see you guys next time. God damn it, coins everywhere. Why did I do this joke? <laughs>